guys, well, so what I want to do now, guys, is because we're, we're, this is a great conversation. We're sort of keeping it, you know, very much in, in sort of the social. I want to yeah. bring this into the personal. A little, right. Um, right. You know, because again, uh, Rob and I just had an, an amazing, like a barn busting two hour webinar about the transformation age and particularly how this is going to affect the future of civilization and self-organization and all that. But obviously there's not going to be any transformation age unless it is coming through each of us individually. In mm -hmm. other words, unless we are active participants in that transformation age, unless we are embodying the values and the principles and the practices and the perspectives that allow us to actually not just, you know, see these challenges, but actually do something about them. Mm -hmm. um, is going to be absolutely paramount. So I, I, I was curious, you know, if there's any number of practices that we can sort of talk about, but I wanted to make this kind of personal and I wanted to ask you guys individually, what has been helpful for you? How, where do you notice yourself seeking refuge and where do you find yourself seeking comfort and where do you find yourself seeking discomfort uh, in the midst of all of this? I mean, I don't have to really seek to find the discomfort. So <laughs> that's my, my first response to that. Um, but honestly, the first, last few weeks, I think in the last couple of days, uh, something has shifted for me. But I was very much in hardcore lower right response mode because it was just absolutely necessary, you know. And that was the practice. It was do as much research as I could to, to prepare myself because, every you know, with the CARES Act and everything that got uh, passed, it's so immense and so complicated. So for me, I wanted to be really on top of that. So honestly, that's been, I was doing a lot of that. And then uh, I was actually doing just sitting practice where mm. no form at the end of the day. And, and that felt like a really nice compliment. You know, there was so much like response and doing that I just needed to let go of it all. Um, but in the last few days, I feel like, you know, we had the bills passed. We have some responses and answers we still got to see how it's going to play out mm -hmm. and that's a little bit unnerving, but I feel like I can relax a little bit more and say, okay, now I'm settling into this new weird, this mm. new temporary weird. It's going to be still weird. I think the whole year, but very weird for the next month or so. So yeah, I'm just going to say that, that it, like what I'm practicing, what I'm doing is shifting a little bit and it's been a lot of pivots over a very short period of time. Mm. And let's just uh, make sure that we're, properly tracking the actual definition of the word weird, which actually yeah. does not mean strange or odd. Weird yeah. literally means uh, in control of one's own fate, which I always thought was funny. That's the only funny. reason why we think it means strange or odd or peculiar is because of a uh, mistranslation from Shakespeare, the three, uh, the three weirding sisters. Uh, well, they were yeah. like three sisters fate. And we took that, we sort of colloquialized it as being strange. But it actually means if you're weird, which I have been my entire life, just to, you know, in case that wasn't completely fucking obvious to everyone watching, <laughs> um, you know, it just means I'm in control of my own fate. Because... Yeah. And there's that song from Stuart, uh, Stuart Davis. Good, Good weird. Yeah. 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 I say that because really, I just don't know how to, um, I, I'm, that's part of my practice is just sitting and owning that. Like, yeah, I don't know. Um, well, I, I, and I like practice. the frame because it, because it is weird <laughs> and we are, and we need to participate with fate, right? We're, yeah. We're, and, and this is like getting your actual hands on the wheel somehow that this, I mean, you're, you're participating with weird and that's um, yeah. actually a very good thing. Uh-huh. Yeah. One of the theme that emerged for us, we did for the responsive meditation training, um, we did a co-design survey for it. We didn't set out the map for the training ahead of time. We gave a survey and, to see where people are at in their practices, um, which ended up being very fitting for the time. But the, the theme that emerged was responding with loving awareness. And so that feels really spot on. So that I feel like that's a little bit where my practice is going, um, obviously because of the training, but that feels appropriate too. those mm -hmm. combination of awareness and loving into loving awareness. And what, how does that play out? Um, in, in my life. So that's fresh for me too. Beautiful. Keith, how about you, man? Well, for me, um, it's been a couple of things, you know, I've been really rooted in my, in my meditation practice really strongly. Uh, of course I have a Zen background, really strong Zen background. So, um, I'm really lucky in that all of my training has been the process and the practice of being with what is completely right. So it's, it's, uh, I mean, even like Suzuki Roshi, he has a great quote, which I love, which is here to do nothing, here to attain nothing, here in this moment and all it contains. Mm. 
And so, you know, because I've been fortunate enough to have a 25 year practice now, here in this moment and all it contains means all it contains, not just the good things, not the things you don't want to consider, not, not your feelings. So the practice space of meditation, while I have various ways of coming back into the moment and back into my body, um, there's a tremendous capacity to be with all that's here, both culturally and personally, um, and to have permission to be inside of all of the experiences, all of the relative experiences of mind, which include, you know, all the things that we've touched upon here. Um, and then letting that go and coming back into basically shikantaza or, or just a simple sitting practice. Um, that's been a really powerful ground for me because it's not, I'm not practicing to escape, I'm practicing to actually be fully here. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so then what that means is when I come out of my morning practice, um, a couple of things. One is that I'm a much better steward of my mind. So I'm very careful about where I get news from and how often I get news and what, why I'm seeking the news. So I'm, I'm like a parent that's sort of watching, uh, watching what it is that I'm allowing to come into my self system. Cause like most of us, I imagine like the first few days I was reading the news, you know, 20 times a day. And then, and on Facebook, you know, three hours a day. And I'm just noticing that like, it was totally toxic and destructive to my mental and emotional well-being. I was, I was in a place where I was almost inconsolable. Um, and so, you know, just noticing that. And so cleaning up then my daily practices. So I only read the news once a day. Um, uh, I have a really strong physical practice. So I'm a martial arts lineage holder. And so um, I've still been teaching my students outside with a lot of space between us, of course. Um, but maintaining the integrity of my practice. Um, and then for me, socially, just maintaining and keeping some really strong connections with really smart, good people that I know via text message. So rather than being on Facebook, it's like sort of some various text threads that are running with people who are very, very smart, um, very embodied, and who it's good to just sort of be in connection with that our 21st century technology allows. Uh, and obviously then, why you're here with us today. Totally. <laughs> and, then the, and then the fourth and final piece for me is relationship. You know, I'm fortunate enough to be in a relationship. Um, it's very nurturing to me. And, uh, and to be orienting towards that relationship emotionally, sexually, other ways uh, different than I used to and ways that are actually helping to ground me again and, and to keep me here in this moment. Beautiful. No, it's absolutely gorgeous. And Keith, um, if you don't mind, I'd love for you to actually share um, what you guys have been doing together uh, in terms of the mm -hmm. intimacy training uh, that you've been, you've been doing. It's really fascinating work, important work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, Alyssa is, is, is my partner's name. She and I were t are teaching a course right now. It finishes next week, but it was called Simple Sex. And um, it takes sort of basic mindfulness and pretty simple practices really around intimacy, touch, and communication, and sort of breaks those things down in ways that are really fundamental and, and very simple. Because um, what happens with couples, of course, is we get spooled up into our stories, and we get spooled up into our reactivity and into whatever our conditioning is and our traumas and all that stuff. And there's so much noise that, like, where do you begin? You know, where do you begin if you've lost sexual connection with your partner, you've lost intimate connection, where do you begin to come back into that? Well, you begin by slowing everything down. You begin by doing really basic touch. You, you sort of learn how to touch again. You learn how to be with sensation again. Um, you learn how to become aware of things like what are things that accelerate your sexual desire and what are things that cause your sexual desire to go on breaks, you know, like the breaks to go on. And you're able to discuss those things. Um, you become more conscious of the stories that you have that, that spool up. So, you know, you, 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 you come on to your partner and she says, no, not tonight. And you spool up into like, oh, the relationship is horrible. You know, like, but being conscious of how quickly that story becomes, becomes what seems real. Mm -hmm. And so we take all those, all those pieces and we break them all apart so that people actually have the opportunity to be in relationship with their partner around all the pieces and to find connection again. Because the stories are, you know, stories always have grains of truth, but the stories are mostly bullshit. Right. 
And of so, course, being quarantined together and, <laughs> and forced into each other's company 24 hours a day. And we're, we're, we're in a 900 square foot apartment right. with two mugs. You know, right. it's like, it's, I mean, this looks spacious, but this is like the whole place. It's an opportunity, <laughs> it's an opportunity to lay down some new stories. I mean, Ryan, you and I yes. were talking at the beginning of the yes. year when we were launching your, uh, your um, Emerge course. Yeah. We're talking about how, you know, there's these little opportunities that we have whenever there's a break of habituation, whatever that happens to be, even a, just a calendar changing uh, right. gives you sort of enough distance, enough of sort of a, a, a break in your own habituation for yeah. you to start, you know, working on some new habituations, basically. Yeah. Replace habituations that aren't working for you anymore with ones that maybe will, you know, bring you a little bit deeper in, in, in the year to come. Yeah, well, and that's... This is one of the biggest breaks. Yeah, that that's what I was saying at the absolutely. beginning of this. That's what I exactly absolutely. was meaning when we first started talking today, that like, it's one of the biggest opportunities and there's some energy behind it that there's like a, a wind behind our backs to help make that happen. I think that's different. Like, whereas in the normal holiday season, I can choose to do that, but I may not choose to do that. But here it's just like, and you're, also, you're also going against the current when you choose to do it during the holiday season in some ways, right? There's yeah. family dynamics, there's parenting. Yeah, absolutely. Dynamics, right? All that shit right now is broken. Yeah. It, it yeah. is. Like, yeah. there's so much freedom. Like, story, what story? The story it's, of going to the mall, the story of going to the gym, those stories don't exist anymore. I know. Yeah, it's, it's a very potent time, kind of like... Going, going out to dinner. <laughs> yeah. That didn't happen. Yeah, like certain events, like maybe solar eclipse when people say the veil is thin, you know, and so more things are possible. It's kind of like something mm -hmm. like that right now where it's just like, mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's inherently potent. Yep. And it's in the gross body. I mean, this is like changing yeah. physically how we go about our day. Well, for most people, I mean, I got to say as a, as a Enneagram type four kind of, you know, social <laughs> recluse, my lifestyle hasn't changed all that much. Um, since quarantine, that's just an honest fact. I spend, I've, I've kind of been a homebody for years, so I've been training for this. Yeah. Um, you know, the biggest shift for me is that my, my wife and daughter are home all day with me now, mm -hmm. um, which is awesome, right? I love having that increased intimacy uh, with them both. I love helping Evie with her homeschooling and, you know, watching her use Zoom to, as a seven-year-old is always, is always pretty cool. Um, but I'm also <laughs> aware that just proximity can create its own Tension. And that's why, Keith, I'm really glad that you sort of um, foregrounded the work that you've been doing because, you know, I've, my, my own prediction is that a year from now, we're going to see both increased divorce rates and increased birth rates. Oh, for sure. <laughs> you know, we're going to see, we're just going to kind of see. It's definitely going to be a population boom for sure. Yeah, yeah right. Um, and so COVID. It's, it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. And, you know, and not to get <laughs> kind of too lost in the meta here, but I think. You know, for me, another opportunity of this transformation age of which we are only in the very beginning chapters. But one of those opportunities, I think, is going to be for the reintegration of the public and the private sphere. So yeah. you know, basically, Ken has talked about um, mm. for years now about how there has been a very basic division of labor that persisted for most of human evolution, really until the Industrial Revolution, where men were largely responsible for public sphere right. activities, women were largely responsible for private sphere activities, which includes things like family and hearth and home and community. Mm -hmm. um, and ever since the Industrial Revolution, and then you know uh, the, the first several waves of feminism, and then finally the deal was kind of sealed with neoliberalism from 1980 until today, the private sphere has been in just like total neglect for decades, right? Just absolute decades. Um, as I said earlier, Warren Farrell really captures it well when he says men have been forced to demonstrate their love for the family by spending time away from the family. Right. Well, now these two spheres are crashing back into each other. And my hope is that just like the 20th century allowed women to move en masse from the private sphere into the public, that this is actually gonna allow men to make a similar move from the public back into revaluing the private. And my sense is if we can actually complete that circuit, if we can actually find a way to reintegrate these two sort of spheres of, of, of our lives, then we're going to start seeing, particularly in men, less anxiety, less depression, less suicide, which, as I mentioned in the Diane show last weekend, is, it continues to be the number one form of gun violence in this country. It's men killing themselves. Mm -hmm. And largely they're killing themselves because they don't have access to the sort of intrinsic value that mm -hmm. can only be sourced from the private sphere, from community and from family mm -hmm. and from loved ones. Right. It's a beautiful way to put it. I mean, I, I love that. I love the sophistication of the overlay there because the data is alarming. 
you know. Well, and, 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 it's, and it's one thing, Keith, to actually say something like, to be like, oh, this, wouldn't it be cool if this just kind of happened? But again, it doesn't happen by itself, right? I mean, social right. conditions- And this is what you're talking about, the script being broken, right? So the script right. being broken, men are at home now, they're being forced at home, they're getting a different experience, they're doing their jobs, a lot of us, well from home. And so what's gonna, what's gonna be different, you yeah. know? And for the men who lost their jobs, they're probably not going to find one for another few months until we're on the other side of this pandemic. And that is going to be painful for those. I mean, again, there's a reason why most men kill themselves after A, they lose their job, B, they lose their wife. Because in the first case, they're losing their extrinsic value. In the second case, they're losing their intrinsic value. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is going to, uh, again, be, just be a new pressure that is going to force many men to, um, to confront this. Probably for the first time, because it, it, you know you lost your job. Yeah, you're gonna feel that pressure to go get a new job, but you can't right now. You can't. You can't leave your house. You got to deal with this for the next several months. And that's gonna be. That's gonna require sort of a rewiring on the level of just like masculine identity in a certain.